The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, because um, obviously we um, we had to record one episode up front because we were going to the X Weddings Conference. A couple, couple of weeks almost now since the X Weddings Conference, we didn't really get a chance last week to to talk about X Weddings. So are you happy? Go well? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Is that it? Yes. Yep. No. Excellent. It no was really good. Any really more good. questions? No. Don't want to do it again. <laughs> no, it was really good. Thank you so much to everybody who came along and all of the really positive feedback that we've had since. It was good. Um, I thought it was. I thought it went really well. The new venue was um, amazing. The Apex Hotel yeah, uh, really, yeah, really, really um, helped us out. Um, we sent off uh, just over five hundred pounds to South West Children's Hospice as well. Do you know something they had uh, between every single um, session when you came out? There were these power drinks did you have try any of those they were like kale power drinks oh i had the orange mind alive. i had the orange one i thought it was a little orange juice i thought it was a little bit small and then i i, I downed it in one and it it, 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 it it like had some kind of ginger infusion and my, my eyes nearly popped out of my head uh, but no it was great i really enjoyed it, it was uh, i can't remember who it, it was great who and, it was there was somebody that i spotted sort of hoovering them just before each session i wish i could remember i, I would name and shame him so uh, so the obvious question is um, so when when's next year's then hmm? <sighs> anyway what are we talking about next <laughs> the fuji cast I'm going to keep uh, pushing him on that one, don't worry. So welcome to the FujiCast, episode number 41. Um, your questions, including something today about P-Mode, and whether P-Mode is something you should consider. Uh, the show lives on your questions. We love to hear from everybody, so if you have a question and, and think, oh, they'll never read it out, they'll never get round to me, get on that keyboard now and bash one out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wrote that before I realised what I'd written. I'm going home. I'm going home. This is terrible. Send, send, send to click at fujicast.co.uk. Oh, God, we'll have the... PC police now saying, oh, it's an innuendo. I really didn't mean to do that one. <laughs> Today, we'll hear a selection of questions from the recent X weddings conference. Voita Hudick, Scott Johnson, Chris Parkinson, Soraya Cordeville, uh, Matt Thompson, and even, guess who? Who? Oh. Because she answered one of the original questions. <laughs> Gemma. Gemma, yes, Gemma's on there. Uh, you've given her a new growl. I d- I wasn't, yeah, that is a new growl, actually. That's not the normal growl, isn't it? Gemma, you, is your voice okay? <laughs> You're right, okay. She'll be so pleased. <laughs> Passing mention for the for the private Facebook group has become a real community of like-minded folks, so thank you very much. Please, I noticed a couple of mic drop picks in there. You will be in so much trouble. A little bit of uh, background, please. doesn't have to be an essay, but it does need to be more than just a, here's an aperture... Here's a shutter speed. And uh, we love those conversation starters. There was a, a, a good one. Actually, I'm going to throw this one a, throw this one across to you. We had a conversation starter this week, didn't we? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. From you go. Marcus. Who? Marcus. Marcus Cohen. Go on, you read it out. Uh, Marcus Cohen. Uh, he says, another business question. Are you, are, sorry, are your wedding businesses set up as sole traders or limited companies? Mm. Thanks. P.S. I do not work for HMRC. <laughs> uh, right, so yeah, for our yeah, friends yeah. across the pond, HMRC is uh, uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, yeah. uh, i.e. the tax man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good question. So, uh, well, I think both I, you I, and I are limited companies. Well, I have a couple of companies, actually. Mm, um, get you. Yeah. Some, uh, one limited and one sole trader. Mm. But not for separation purposes. I might very quickly add up because no. there are some photographers who do separate their businesses, artificially yep. separate businesses. And that's a very, very dodgy and wrong line to take. Yeah. No, I agree totally. I mean, we should all, we all have to pay the fair taxes. And no yeah. matter how much you don't like paying taxes, we should all pay the same ones. Yeah. Um, are you listening, Amazon and Apple? <laughs> Don't you start. And various Do you want to write people. a manifesto? Yeah, so I'm a limited company, and I I, I mean, this harks back to when I uh, used to have my own kind of businesses before photography. I always had limited businesses. And so my photography business is a limited business as well. And uh, from my point of view, it offers, you know, certain certain amount of protection, but it's not for that reason. Yeah. Um, Tax-wise, personally, and my accountant's kind of recommendation currently is that it's still a better way of doing things um, in terms of you know, all the dividend taxes going up like every day it seems um, so it does seem more um, economical for us as a you know as a business right now but you know for some people that may not be the case and you know 
absolutely do not take our word for uh, what's right or wrong you, you you really should be looking at the HMRC website and I think they have like a little step through guide you can do fill actually, in yeah much you, easier to use now you can fill yeah, in your yeah, circumstances yeah. and it says you should be a sole trader or you should be a limited company and uh, yeah do that for sure but the most important thing is play by the rules either yes. way don't put cash in your pocket no don't not pay your taxes. Um, I'm still... In- don't not be insured. Yes, absolutely. I'm still incredulous when I go into a store these days. And we have some local shops close to where I live that say cash only. And you think, this doesn't this feel right to me. Maybe, maybe mm. I, may, am I might be a bit... It's like when you go into the into the fish and chip shops or you know whatever, and, and the, the till never shuts, the drawer stays yeah. open, yes. and they never you, they never slam it, and you yeah. you just know. You, you I know. don't shop in places like that. Hmm. Because I think if I'm playing with the rules, mm-hmm. how dare you not play with the rules? I suppose I suppose ultimately, whilst we're making an assumption that might be the case for them, mm. you don't actually have to slam the till shut, like, in you know, open no. all hours, you know, get your fingers <laughs> caught, just to prove that you're paying your taxes. Oh. It is perfectly valid that you might just fill your, your thing up and just take notes on a piece of paper, whatever. But saying yeah. that, yeah. more than likely they are. Andy Stonia and Albert Palmer had a couple of things to say within the Facebook uh, post about that. And if you want to see it, it's it's in the Fujicast private group. Please go and join it if you're not yet, yet a member. And if you're not on Facebook, I'm sorry, you'll miss that. Uh, Andy, but on that point, just yeah. to interject, sorry, the um, we will be putting a lot more content on the website. So mm. um, things like the links to the Facebook group and um, some kind of images from interviewees and links to anything we talk about that we think is uh, of benefit to you. Yeah. Uh, the website, thefujicast.com, uk website uh, currently is a more of a holding place for the uh, for people to listen to the podcast but we are uh, well i am going to try and make it a lot more engaging over the the very cold winter months andy stoney said i went with uh, just going back on the business thing very quickly i went with a limited company back in 2004 i like the fact that it's financially independent for, from me so worst case anybody sues i'm personally not liable and that's always what the accountant says to me every time i've said Oh, divvy tax and stuff like that. He said, yeah, but you've got to think bigger picture and uh, being liable. Was that your tummy or mine? <laughs> Be- <laughs> I thought, thought Gemma had crept uh, in the back door. I haven't eaten since the expenses yeah. conference. <laughs> um, I also paid myself a dividend as a wage, which is tax efficient. Director sounds cool too. But then on, on the back of that, Albert Palmer said, well, yeah, I went limited, but that was six, seven years ago when the tax benefits were pretty big. Now large dividends are taxed. So it doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah. It's worth you asking your accountant, as every case is different. And then, and then the the it just goes on and on this yeah. thread. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that point about dividends is really important because yeah. it used to be in the good old days when I was a contractor good back old in the days. city. Um, during the war, during the war, we used to we used to you know we used to get amazing day rates, and you would just not pay yourself anything and then do a mm. dividend every kind of quarter um, and then they brought out this law oh, this tax law called IR35 Inland Revenue 35 which yeah. which essentially put an end to uh, contractors working like that and um, it's a fair law it's not uh, you know I'm not, I'm not complaining about it everybody has to pay their taxes yeah. um, but the dividends currently are I think still just about tax more tax efficient than uh, standard kind of sole trader uh, PAYE stuff. just just. Of course, uh, um, and we, we are due for a, an election soon, and uh, I, th- I think we're free of the uh, <laughs> of the laws that say no. We won't we won't side on on any side, obviously. But um, yeah, it's against the law. Y- yeah, it's against the law Shall to have I a political on? opinion uh, on yeah. a public broadcast. No, well, I want yeah, and this is a public. I was about to say something about one of the things in a manifesto that could make a difference to this, but but you know, I'm not going to. No, because it's against the law. Because it is against the law. Warning! I know. Warning. I know. I've listened. Kev spoke. Yes, public broadcasters are us. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, you can have the first non-political question. Okay, then. I have a uh, question here from um, Boris Johnson, and it says, <laughs> can you please tell everybody that? <laughs> Don't be rude. <laughs> uh, no, so this is from Darren Lingerfelt, and uh, he says, hello, uh, Darren here from Charlotte, North Carolina. Love the podcast. Uh, this question is mainly for Kev. Uh, given that the X-Pro3 hot topic we have here, do you plan on switching your setup back to X-Pro setup? Since it will be current technology, or will you stay with XT3? 
I also would like to know if it would be hard for me to shoot a wedding with an XT3 and an X-Pro3 combo since they are different bodies. Uh, I believe you've done this in the past with X-Pro2, X-T2 and would like to know your professional wedding experience. Okay, so this is also a conversation and a question we had from Jack Lardenberg. Uh, I think he asked yeah. you that question. He's asked me that yeah, question. Yeah. He was at the X Weddings Conference as well. Um, so, yeah, I will... A lot of interest in this body at the moment. So I think I think we'll have a couple of repeats on that one. Yeah, and, and ultimately I'm going to repeat myself effectively by saying, look, you know, the X-Pro3 uh, is, in my mind a more enjoyable camera to use technology wise yeah at, right at this moment in time it has a little bit of a uh, one-upmanship over the xt3 but I, i'm fairly sure all of that stuff will come in firmware updates don't quote me on that though and really it comes down to what you enjoy using the most i i i have all oh, for the last 18 months or so i've been using one x pro 2 and one xt3 no problems whatsoever the menu systems the same it's mm. just all you have to do is remember which item you know which position to put your eye to the camera um neil's looking at me very looking at my belly very bizarre <laughs> am i I'm it's not. making making terrible noises um <laughs> we i think we should have a biscuit in a yeah, minute i think so <laughs> have you not eaten this morning no i never eat please eat before you um so yeah you broadcast uh, honestly i think the <laughs> the idea yeah. is um for an x pro and an xt isn't it should not really be an issue for people no. um ultimately they're, they're pretty much the same it's just the ergonomics and yeah i will be switching i will be keeping my xt3 um because i i use it for filming and it's still a very fine camera of course it's a brilliant camera inside mm. it's just i prefer shooting still with yeah. the the X Pro three, and I have actually loved that X Pro three. I have to say, I know, and it's funny because initially you you sort of set out on a journey not to I, not necessarily purposefully not love it, but you weren't sure you were going to like it at all. No, mainly well, because of that back screen. Yeah, I mean the back screen is actually fine. It's it's the well the, the what they call the the um, uh, sub monitor that little square mm. one inch square thing on the back. I still think that's pretty pointless frankly mm. um but the hidden lcd the folding down lcd I, i've got to i've got used to that for mm. sure um and it's good it's good it's all good it's all good thank you darren right the gump has been this is a long question are you ready dig in this has been sitting in the inbox a number of weeks nay months so a massive apologies sir alan gump it's actually been superseded by another one you sent in last week which i'm saving for a week to come kevin neil first um to get to the uh, the, the the trivial stuff stand by um, he's going to mention the S word. No, no, no. please, no, yes. no, no. Seagull. Oh, uh, he. I'm not listening. We mentioned it, didn't we? On the, you're absolutely seagulls right. Seagulls do not exist. Yeah, only the great unwashed refer to these birds as seagulls. The the uh, cognoscenti will always name the particular species, or if un unknown, simply refer to the bird by the term gull. He's right, though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I thought he was wrong. I thought he was writing in to to, to say no. You're wrong. But oh, actually, no, no, he was supporting you. Actually, I've always said that. Yeah, yeah. Well, since um, I can't, I can't help ago. you on the local bird front. Pardon. Should you visit the San Francisco Bay Area, I'll happily point out the difference between a California gull and a Western gull. And remember, if you need to determine the number of miles and a degree of longitude or given latitude, I am your man. We'll bear that in mind. <laughs> I want to thank you both for, for the deeply thoughtful and provocative podcast a couple of, <laughs> couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually. The format, do you remember when we went to the Don McCullen exhibition? Mm. And then uh, and we, went, we went afterwards to the Lamb and Flag with Michael and Sanjay. Mm. He says, definitely one to be repeated. We got to hear your raw reactions to this powerful work as well as your more widely roaming chat afterwards. Um, <laughs> wildly roaming. It was quite wildly roaming. <laughs> fortunately, while you were still in the early stages of refueling. Mm. Your occasional focus on the ph photographers who put themselves in danger to record their story has been a strength of this podcast. Do you know you're going to love next week's episode then, Gump? Because uh, Jason Florio talks about his time working on the ships to photograph the humanitarian crisis as Africans made their way across that ocean to, to Europe. So that's next week's. Anyway, it goes on. I was a young grad student. And I had the opportunity. This is a great opportunity, Kev, to meet W. Eugene Smith. Ooh. Can you imagine that? Ooh, yeah. Well, no, I can't imagine it, but I would imagine it was an amazing experience. He was already an old man. He had uh, already... Now, this is the interesting bit. He'd already had his struggles, both financial and artistic. And, you, you know, you think of people like W. Eugene Smith, and you would have thought, surely they never, ever struggled for anything um, in terms of monetary or fiscal uh, reward for, for their incredible photography. But clearly he did. Mm. Yeah. 
He had already had his struggles, both financial and artistic, with projects sponsored by others, Life and Magnum most notably. But he continued on. He epitomised what you guys quoted in the podcast, conscious obligation. So it does get to a question. My question is, how can we embrace this obligation? Although I'm not a professional photographer, I have to ask this question of myself, particularly as I'm nearing retirement, and hopefully we'll have some good years ahead in which I can do something significant, and hopefully with camera in hand. Smith, McCullin, Stoddart. Penfound, Pellegrin, and a host of others uh, show us one way, but there must be others, and each of each of us must find it or risk asking the pitiful question: Why did I live? God, he's got very deep this week. Ripes, Gump, yeah, really, yeah, wow. But are you looking for that that project that's going to be the that's that's what that's what made that's what Mullins did photography about? Um, well, you know, it's interesting because. Uh, Voita said at the uh, conference, didn't he? he? He came up with this amazing line. Oh, the why? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, and also he said, um, "We're not saving lives; we're saving memories," um, which I thought was. Oh, was it Voita that said that? I think it was. Voita. Oh, I didn't credit him on something I did. Oh, oh, sorry, Voita. Oh, thief. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I'm fairly sure it was him, but but uh, maybe he sourced that elsewhere. I don't know. But it it, it kind of reminded me of that that um, thing that. Um, Zach Arias also said, uh, you know, we're not curing cancer, yeah. we're taking pictures. Yeah. And yes, absolutely. Uh, you, you know, for example, I'm going to spend the next however many hours here with Neil. <sighs> <laughs> and then after that, I've got a, a three hour drive to a wedding yeah. um, that I'm shooting tomorrow. And, and I'm looking forward to the wedding. Of course, I'm looking forward to the wedding. But, uh, you know, can you seriously in the industry? Well, we do seriously. And I know you do definitely, Neil, because we've, mm. we've spoken about it. But does the industry, does the wider industry of photography actually think, oh, they're just wedding, you know, they're just going to a wedding. It's, yeah. it's that's not serious stuff. That's not that's not, you know, kind of, you know, history making, if you like. Mm. But actually it is, you know, it absolutely is. And it's it's personal histories. Micro that, that stories, count. if you like, aren't they, really, of people, people's lives? Micro stories, personal histories. And, and it's the embryonic, it's the first day of an entire new history. And, mm. you know, you're there to photograph it. So, um, and, and that's why I'm so um, kind of vocal about the documentary approach to it, really, in that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have any effect on that day. I want that to happen as it happened because that's a history making moment right and i'm not saying that you know you shouldn't do any other way i'm just that's my my, my kind of approach to it but you know so i had a conversation on um, on youtube with a a uh, another photographer the other day and it was a comment that came up on my i did a book review of darcy padilla's um family life well, that's one of your favorites that book yeah. darcy padilla yeah, family yeah, life yeah. it's 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 out of this world and that is a profound body of work. very raw as well absolutely profound body of work um but but the comments the comment kind of um, started. He, he mentioned he said, you know, I've looked at this several times now, and how can I ever think my photography will be important? Oh. And you know, my 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 reply was as I just said, it's irrelevant. It is absolutely irrelevant. Um, and I often say this, and and you you can steal this off me as well if you want, Neil. <laughs> I, I often say, uh, you know, your your pictures don't have to be good; they just have to be important. Oh, I like that. I'm having that. I'm gonna. I can. Yeah, t-shirt worthy. <laughs> but with a with a caveat is they only have to be important to either you or the person you're taking the pictures for. Yeah. They don't have to be important for the wider world, the Instagrams, the you know the the newspapers, anything. It's it's your the bubble of importance that's around you at the time of taking that picture. And so that manifests itself in this really long-winded reply, of course. That <laughs> it was a long question. It though. was yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just getting you back, Gump. Uh, in that you know actually. You you cannot use the benchmark. You cannot benchmark yourself on the work of others because no. you will forever be. Uh, if you have any sense of uh, humility, you will forever be looking downwards and backwards rather than looking forwards. And you know you have to you have to have conviction in your own um, storytelling for sure. And and if that just means you, you you know, I mean for heaven's sake, Glasgow Lee is is. Um, He's taking pictures of people in his bathtub, and he's got a book out of it. He's got an exhibition out of it. I know everything. You know, and I failed to have a photo. I mean, it, it, mind you, he did actually offer to to make the picture when we'd all been out to an Indian restaurant, and and frankly, I was forgetting things five minutes away. I said to him, "Why did you ask Neil to get in the bathtub for your book and not me?" Oh. And do you know what he said? Well, he said, "Because I don't think your feet would reach over the edge." <laughs> 
uh, well he's a fair judge of character yeah um, uh, but so to go back to the more important uh, subject was uh, uh, you know it, it's important to look at other work of course and we, we all get inspired by it but um, you know use it for inspiration rather than a benchmark and, and never feel down about what you're doing regardless absolutely. Um, unless of course you are calling a seagull a seagull in which case <laughs> you trouble. should be chained up lo- yeah. flogged because it's a terrible thing thank you Alan Any- anything else you want to say and that's all I had to say about that alright oh, that's brilliant thank oh you and another much. thing no oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I love those uh, long long emails from the gump um, they're always very welcome and his fact checking is, is, is but he is the official fact checker I'm afraid nobody else can be the fact checker on this show at all right Don't your question it. okay so uh, i have another long question actually and this is from joseph in, Abad, uh, from connecticut i right. uh, love the podcast 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 Left the podcast uh blah 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 <laughs> does he say that he yeah. does say oh, right, that okay. yeah i love photographing my local farmer's market which i manage and mm. uh, it's been gratifying work because the market serves an underprivileged and underfed community oh. uh, so i bet that'd be quite an interesting yeah. uh, photo story uh, it's been a great way to work on street photography mixed with event photography, reportage, and a little food photography thrown in, of course. However, my time with the market is coming to an end, and I will be passing my duties to a successor. Mm. Now, he has two questions. Um, Let's do one at a time. Okay, number one. Mm. I'm not a wedding photographer, and don't believe I'll be getting into that anytime soon. However, what strategies can event photographers, community photographers like him, take from wedding photography in order to self-advertise? Well, I guess really wedding photographers, I think, are excellent at self-promotion. And, um, you know, the way that they use Instagram, um, the way that they use YouTube, I, I think that's to be admired in, in many wedding photographers. And I, I think that's, that's a, you know, marketing is something you can take from wedding photographers. Mm. I think look, at, look, look at what the local uh, wedding photographers in your market around you, a market with a small M now, um, are doing. Because it's likely that you could learn a, a thing or two off them about the way that they market their, their business. Mm, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, and then, and then you can move that into your social documentary work. Yeah, and connections. You know, c- connections with vendors, suppliers. Yeah, all of that kind of stuff yeah. is 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 key with that. I guess. Mm. Um, okay, so second question. I currently deal with community members of all budgets and need to be available to them. Yet fair to myself. At the same time, I won't guarantee any posed canned, canned, planned, canned. Does say canned and planned? Canned. Yeah, canned. And it's canned like candid. Canned, no. Canned. I suppose canned is like canned laughter, isn't it? They used to get on the television, so it's all is it's it? fake, fake okay. laughter. Oh uh, yeah, like canned laughter. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I just said. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I won't guarantee any posed canned. <laughs> I was, or I was listening. I was really. <laughs> no, right, I'm going to say it one more time. Okay. I won't guarantee any posed canned or planned shots. Is that like canned laughter? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's not my style of photography. Any tips on keeping a pricing standard? Hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, when it comes down to pricing, it is absolutely all down to personal circumstance, I guess, ultimately. Because if you are, if you just absolutely adore loving and shooting um, work, not necessarily weddings in this case, and you've got ten million pounds in the bank, then. Do it, let's do it as a yeah. personal project yeah. uh if not which is probably the case then you know don't don't base your pricing on on what we tell you or what other people are charging base your pricing on your circumstance so do a little business plan and uh you know i always say when i do my my kind of um business workshops is start your business plan at the end so start with what you need to to live off each oh, month right. yeah um, what you want to do in terms of holidays and paying off all your debts and all that kind of stuff and work backwards rather than thinking, all right, I, I just need 20 weddings or 20 events and I'm going to charge £3,000 or $3,000 because that seems what everybody else is doing. Uh, work backwards from what you what you need and that will that will give you your price. That will that will give you the price you need to survive or to, you know, to, to kind of get going. Uh, everything else on top will be a bonus. Do you think too many people um, copy what, uh, what what their competitors do? Uh, it's obviously uh, a mistake, according to what you've just said. I think, well, I mean, at the end of the it, it's not a mistake because you do have to do market research and you have mm. to be competitive. Of course you have to be competitive. Um, but ultimately, if you do a business plan and your business plan says, you know, I'm, I'm in the I'm in the. I'm in the shit because I've got so much debt. I'm yeah. going to have to charge extortionately more than other people. Then it's just not going to work because the market forces, to supply and demand, and the, the the equilibrium of scale there will just you know will push you out of the marketplace. Um, but ultimately, hopefully, you're not in that situation, and you know you have to you have to adjust your working environment, your working configuration, your business configuration to to support 
to support mm. whatever you're doing. Uh, you, for example, in my case, uh, you know, I'm doing probably more workshops and stuff than I ever have done. Um, you know, purely because you know the last few years, I'm you know I don't work in August, and uh, you know winter weddings are a little less fewer and far between. Yeah. So you know I'm just reconfigurating the business a little bit. Um, and and that's what you have to do. So uh, Joseph, by the way, he links to his uh, Facebook page for right. a reason here, and it says, "I run a once a week personal project for anybody interested." So if you are interested, I'll I'll add it to the to the show notes as well. But it is Facebook dot com Joseph dot Abad A B A D. Thank you, Joseph. Phil Hindmore, dear Neil, Kevin, thanks so much for the podcast. I've been listening to to you talk on the show about using P mode and watching your YouTube video, Kev, on that subject. I haven't used it at all really on the X-T3 and tend to use aperture or manual mode, but you mentioned about the R&D budget that goes into cameras such as the X-T3, and my question is, how clever really is P-Mode? What information is it actually taking into account? Is it just trying to get a good average, well-exposed picture that avoids extremes of uh, depth of field and shutter speed, or is it actually doing something a bit more clever? Thank you, from Phil. In the, in the Lake District. Ah, okay. Oh, I love the Lake District. Yeah, I love the Lake District too. Well, okay, here's an analogy, because we have covered this a little bit yeah, before. Yeah, once, um, once before, yeah. Uh, here's the analogy, I suppose. Uh, to, to me, P-Mode is a little bit like, uh, you know, riding a bike and getting in a car. Yeah. You know, you get on a bike, you've got to pedal, you've got to change the gears, you've got to switch the lights on, you've got to you know, be a lot more careful, you're not going to get anywhere that you can't get in your car, perhaps, and you get in a car, you switch the engine on, uh, the computer does everything else, especially if you've got an automatic. Yeah. And there you go. That's ultimately it. It is a personal thing, of course. Um, but for me, P mode just makes life a lot simpler where applicable, and it's not always applicable. Do, do you, if there was a percentage in your weddings, how much would you be shooting P mode, and how much would you be in, in manual or aperture, or whatever? In the summer, m- many weddings I'll shoot one hundred percent in P mode. No way. Yeah. Why not? Well, even well into the evening. Yeah. Well, hmm. especially in the evening. Yeah, okay. especially in the evening. The thing is, what you have to remember is P-Mode is, is clever, as uh, Phil kind of mentioned or alluded to. So it's not going to be trying to shoot at F8 in really low-light situations. No. It's going to be forcing you to F1.4 or F2. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and it's going to be adjusting the ISO, pushing the ISO up, and you can always override shutter. The one thing that I, I will uh, perhaps caveat that with is that the shutter speed, I might adjust the shutter speed because mm. sometimes the auto ISO setting will push that down. So I might set that manually in extreme circumstances in the summer. In the winter, less so, because in the winter, the light is more tricky. Uh, things are moving around a little bit more. But in you know, in the daytime, I'm shooting almost everything oh, in P-Mode. It was almost all in P-Mode. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's an education. There you go. Lazy Kev, they call me. <laughs> Not at all. Um, right, this week... Well, we don't have an interview this week. Um, we, um, we're, we're playing back. Um, this did take quite a while to compile, by the way, and there was a lot of it, I know, and, and you know... We've got fifteen minutes or so, um, but uh, we put together some of the um, some of some of the answers from the Q and A session that happened at the end of, of the day. Um, <laughs> why are you huffing? <laughs> Somebody, um, Chris, right. Chris Parkinson, forced me to do a fist bump in that. Q&A. Oh yes, you did do a fist. bump. I was like, yeah. do you not realise I'm 120 yeah. years old? Yeah, you're now awesome. Yeah, um, he, officially, he's only about eight, and I'm like <laughs> fist bump. Well, we had uh, all, the, all the team were there. Chris Parkinson, Wojta Hurik. Um, we had uh, Matt Thompson, of course, with his amazing films that he, he makes within um, within New York Play Studios. Mm-hmm. Um, there was Scott Johnson. Soraya, of course, Soraya, with the, the incredible photography mm. from her NGO work. And, of course, there was <laughs> you, Kev, as well. But yes. You're not really featured in, the, uh, in what's about to come up. No. Um, because... <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, I kind of left both of us out of that bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. But um, the whole thing, though, bizarrely, um, starts with our... our oh, and there we are. You've got your voice back. No. Starts with, starts with your beloved, Gemma, who was uh, asked the question, if she could make a podcast, what would she make it about? I think I'd do it on how, um, how to keep going through the tough times of anything in life, a business or bringing up kids or swapping careers. And Because the more people I speak to, and I've seen it obviously very close to home, it's really, really difficult. And 
Um, I've done a lot of work with um, something called solution focused hypnotherapy, which is all about kind of looking for the happiness in life and not listening to all the noise. So well, that was Kevin in the background. You could just hear chirping in the question if Gemma actually needed that level of support. Surely Kev's shoulders large enough for a proper size husbandly lean? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's why I do it. <laughs> I do a podcast on or Sam and I could just I don't know I reckon we might record something about you two note to self then keep the studio locked for the foreseeable and only share alarm code with Mullins so onto the serious stuff well serious ish as you'll find out question from the floor if we were to pick up a digital camera we had 10 years or more ago and try and shoot a wedding or say some street work now would it be good enough would it have the oomph to be able to stand up to the modern tech we favour now in our kit bag and to answer this question, Scott Johnson. Uh, ten years ago, I was shooting the S3, Fuji from S3. Great, great camera. Um, the camera's just a tool, I think. You know, as long as you've got your, the insight in you know, what we said earlier about looking for light and location and stuff like that. Yeah, people don't ask JK Rowling what typewriter she's got. She just writes awesome stuff. She could write it on a 50-year-old typewriter or a brand new word processor side. I think that's a good question, but as long as it's the artist and not the brush, he can shoot anything. Next question concerns starting up as a wedding photographer, and this one's Fujifilm specific. Which two primes would the panel suggest a couple well with an X-T3? We threw this one in Chris Parkinson's direction. Well, um, I'm, I'm a believer. Uh, I shoot um, one camera, one lens for an entire wedding, and I shoot pretty much everything the 23 1.4 or uh, 35 equivalent. Uh, um, and for me, that's the only lens I would need to shoot an entire wedding. For me personally, I don't like the long lenses. I don't want to. I don't want to turn up at a wedding and feel like I'm shooting wildlife, if that makes sense. Um, I want to be in amongst the action. And for me to do that, I need to have like a, a, a widish lens so I can shoot from me to you. Or yeah, and I believe that for me, I want to shoot a wedding from the inside out and not from the outside in. Um, so for my recommendation would just be: you don't need two lenses; just get a 35. But obviously that's different for every single person and their vision and how they want to shoot. Sticking with the subject of weddings, a question was raised about so-called wedding burnout and how the panel deal with it in the context of taking too much on. Soraya Courteville took this one on, although being the wild card speaker at a conference otherwise about weddings, her answer probably won't surprise you. I used to uh, go out with a wedding photographer and I was always a second shooter and I think one year we did about 60 weddings and after that we split up and um, I don't have done weddings anymore. <laughs> So that's how I do with it. <laughs> Quit! <laughs> Scott, you shoot, you shoot a lot of weddings every year, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, and how do you deal with it? So the most I ever did one year was 113. <laughs> which is why I look at 807 years old. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness now, I get really, I'm really good at managing my time. So I'll, I'll never do three in a row and I'll never work a Sunday. So I help burn out with that. I, so I, I look at the diary going forward and think, well, I could deal with the money there, but I've already got a Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, so I'm just going to stop. So I think it's self-discipline that helps you burning out personally. We've mooted the importance of personal projects on the Fuji cast before to keep you fresh, to keep you energised as a photographer, and the subject attracted a variety of answers from the panel, starting with Wojta Hudik, whose own project about a pensioner veteran runner seemed a good place to start. Introduced by Kevin as moderator for the session. Uh, let's go to Wojta, because the pictures of the, uh, the runner in the beginning, that's a, that was a personal project, right? And uh, so how do you deal with that in terms of fitting in with the business okay i think it's very important because uh for example i burn out and after that i did my first personal project and with that project i was nominated to biggest check uh, photo contest and uh, with this picture of old guy i i won it and it was in category sport and I guess I was only one guy who don't shoot sport, but I win. <laughs> and uh, for me it was really important because of storytelling. I could use my habits from wedding at another topic. And I am so glad because I feel free to do different pictures than from weddings. Scott Johnson. Um, I love weddings. I absolutely adore shooting weddings, but I think a personal project is really, really important. 
um, I did a project in Auschwitz uh, three years ago, four years ago, and I shot entirely on film because I wanted to challenge myself to prove that I could still shoot film. So I do that, and then every now and again, I'll meet up with one of the guys from Fuji Film, we'll go shoot some street in London. Uh, but my passion is architecture, so I've been working on an architecture project for, oh my God, forever. So I'm, when I finish that, that's gonna be put forward for a, a body of work. So that's an ongoing project, but it's so important to break away from the wedding side of it, because I, I shoot an X-T3 when I'm not doing weddings, because it's the X-T3 and GFX of my wedding cameras. And if I pick up the XC3, that's not work. It's just it's just fun. So I find having a second, third, or even fourth body uh, helps with that. Chris Parkinson. I think personal projects are massively important, uh, and I think that these are the places where we can create a safe place where we can make mistakes and uh, push boundaries, and uh, uh, we should push ourselves into doing personal projects uh, just to kind of push the fear. Zaria Corteville. My personal projects are my trips away. That's my personal project. I still get work out of it, but it's... Um, and I do those between kind of December and April when I'm quiet. It makes sense to me. But I need that. I need that for me creatively and for my mental health as well. So, yeah, for me, it's... I'm, I actually need to do those, otherwise I would go crazy. Another question we've fielded on the Fujicast in recent episodes is the subject of post-production and filters, and what happens if, after you've done your careful work, a client takes that work and applies, say, Instagram filters and changes the whole look of the shoot. A good opportunity, too, for Mullins to gently tease one of the speaker lineup, known for his attention to detail when it comes to post. Scott, they must change your pictures all the time, so... <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, I, I give low resolution files with every coverage that I do. So I give them a resized Facebook uh, picture. So everything's at 2,048 pixels. So it doesn't, Facebook algorithm doesn't ruin it. Um, I'm not that bothered, if I'm honest. Um, most of my clients are quite happy with the edits that I do anyway. So they won't change it. They might crop in and they might do a crop. I think oh, that's a bit weird, but to be honest, not many change it or if they do I don't know about it so I think ignorance is bliss in that case Chris Parkinson uh, it's happened a couple of times before and I, uh, it's really frustrating I think sometimes when uh, you spend the, the time and effort in editing photos and putting a gallery together that you think is, is, is suitable for them and then they drop an Instagram filter on it just because it fits within the rest of their feed I think it's frustrating but uh, to me they've, they've paid me I've done the job that they wanted maybe it's not worth getting hung up over because you're going to cause yourself more stress and I think it's probably better just to say oh wait okay push under the carpet and move on What advice did the panel have for a photographer starting out in the business of weddings or indeed any other form of social photography where you want to make some income First to answer on this one filmmaker Matt Thompson um, Just think about what made you pick up the camera in the first place you know go back to whatever it was that made you want to do that and focus on that you know don't kind of yeah get too muddied with the path of what other people are doing just yeah follow what you want to do chris parkinson there is no right and there is no wrong in this industry you do what you makes you happy and what inspires you and that is as simple as my uh, advice is going to be that dovetailed very neatly into motivation Earlier in the day, Voiter had shared his why in terms of what drives you forward, what your reason for making pictures is. And so that drove a question to the rest of the panel about their own why. What motivates them to carry on making pictures, to do this photography thing? With answers from Soraya, Chris, Scott and Matt. I don't really know how to do anything else. (laughs) I'm really rubbish at everything else. My motivation really was just to... I've I've always been quite creative and I wanted to do something creative and it was the only thing I kind of thought would be easy to get into. And But I've always tried really hard to be good at whatever I've got into. So I work really hard and it's just some... It's the only thing really that I can work hard at and still enjoy. I do it so... Monday to Friday, I don't have to have a shower. <laughs> and uh, just go out on a Saturday. And uh, that's why I shoot weddings. Uh, no, I started photography because of, uh, obviously, I told you before, uh, snowboard photography, and that was a reason. Um, and I continue to do it because it's the best job I've ever had. Um, I think we uh, uh, every uh, every morning um, if I go to shoot a wedding uh, we get to go into such private environments we get invited to a bride or a groom's house and literally the only people are there are the best friends or the family or the parents and we somebody who doesn't know the family we get invited into these 
ultra amazing occasions and we get to be a flyer on the wall for this so it's like uh, it is like I've, every day I feel honoured to do this job and it is the best job I've ever had pretty much that's why I still stick with it so I can't draw uh, so I paint my light it's a bit cliche I know but um, but the reason I keep doing it is that what we do with as Chris said we're very privileged to capture a moment in time that's going to last forever and I think that in the wedding albums that Jurgensen had at the back and what we all do, we make people last forever. And I think that's really, really important. And, you know, in this day and age, people take a thousand pictures a month on their phone and you don't get anything printed. But the fact that the work that we're all taking ends up on someone's wall or in someone's wedding album is so important because people do last forever. And that's why I keep doing what I do. Uh, yeah, kind of echoing some of those ideas, really. I mean, I'm you know completely driven to create like I can't imagine doing any kind of job where I wasn't creating something every day I started off in a completely different path but I actually found that it was the the creativity of what I was doing was actually what was driving me not what I thought was driving me so you can kind of cross that path and yeah as long as I'm able to create something do an original story you know that's kind of what motivates me the next question was aimed most firmly at Mullins as the resident book collector Looking at his collection, what's his favourite? Okay, well, the best one, the best one I have is the, um, I like, it's called um, Once Upon a Time in Wales by and Ian Haynes. Ian Haynes or Andy Haynes, I think it was. It's like you'd never have heard of it, but it's literally this guy that um, grew up in a mining village in Wales. Uh, he used to take pictures on his film camera. He stuck all of his films under his bed, didn't think anything of it. Uh, when his parents died, he went back to the house and found all these films. He redeveloped them. And essentially, they're pictures of old men in pubs and so these pubs don't exist anymore he went to try and find as many of those old men as possible uh, most of them have died a lot of them died um, but it's great it's all black and white and like gurning old men in a Welsh mining pub and stuff I absolutely love that book um, yeah so that's probably and I have lots of books back to the topic of inspiration a simple what question from the floor answered in order by Matt, Scott, Sarah and Chris all kinds of places for me from you know theatre as I talked about earlier to you know I watch all kinds of movies you know, I love Hitchcock um, all kinds of places I love street photography you know I look at a lot of photography and take inspiration from that um, so anywhere and everywhere really there's no kind of set place just anything that I pick up and I'm like yeah that you know I connect with that big fan of films so I mean obviously in the Joker recently um, the cinematography in that is just sublime and that's my style all over so natural light leading lines negative space so anything along those lines is ticking my boxes um, my inspiration is probably the, just the country that I'm in and the people that I meet and I will honestly try and represent them as they are so I don't try and get too kind of bogged down with where my inspiration comes it kind of comes to me I take a lot of inspiration from movies and stuff but uh, obviously the, and I feel like the industry that we're in the biggest inspiration is all is always the people that's in front of us as well and to, to connect with the personalities and uh, kind of pick up on the little cues and, uh, and the, the things that happen within weddings themselves right embarrassing moments where stuff didn't photographically quite go to plan Surely the panel had their fair share of these. Matt Thompson won on this score. Uh, I don't know if it's the most embarrassing, but probably the most awkward moment I ever had was uh, a wedding in France. I was, to be honest, just kind of killing time until I was going in for the groom prep. Um, and they had this, like, super elaborate cake that spent an absolute fortune on it. I think they brought it over from the UK. Um, and I was standing on the other side of the room, and I suddenly saw the cake start to topple. So I legged it over... And I just caught the top tier before the rest of it fell over. And then the bride walked in, and it was just me standing there ordering the top tier. Uh, so that was a bit of an awkward conversation. <laughs> it wouldn't be a photography q and I think, without this final question from the X weddings Conference 2019 in Bath. If you could choose one person, dead or alive, to make a portrait of, who would that be? Marlins, of course, had to throw in a true DeLorean-flavoured one right at the end. Uh, Marlon Brando. Will Smith. He seems a cool guy. I'd like to have a beer with Will Smith, and I think his character would come across in the pictures really well, so, yeah, Will Smith. Mine would be Steve McCurry, because he's my absolute hero. Um, I'd go for Henry VIII. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I reckon it'd be great, Henry VIII. Brilliant. 
That was a lot of fun from the X Weddings Q and A session at the uh, the end of the the first day, and of course next year um, there'll be another one of those. Um, <laughs> have I talked you into it yet? Are, are you must you, you must be thinking I, I just so need to organise that today. How about new? <laughs> I tell you what, here's something. Right, you've got a bit greyer. <laughs> Yeah, and I've got a black eye, believe it or not. <laughs> oh yeah, we did you know we didn't talk about that right at the start of the show. Uh, what was how did you get that black eye? Uh, in fact, no, come back to that. Yeah. Do you do you know what first? Yeah. Uh do you know what? What was I gonna say? Do you know what? Um, oh yes, so X Weddings next year. Tomorrow. Um what I really would like from people mm. if they uh, if they are so inclined is to either by the click at foodcast.co.uk email address or by the Facebook group. Um, suggest some speakers Ooh, for me, yeah. and I have a long list, of course. And I have, um, uh, uh, you know, what 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 I like to do with the X weddings is to have at least one person who's never publicly, you know, been on the speaking circuit before. I like to yeah. try and try and give them a hand up, if you like. And uh, they do need, you know, the, the only premise really is that they need to be shooting with Fujifilm camera gear and uh, they don't necessarily need to be a superstar they don't even necessarily need to be uh, you know wedding photographers because we do have the um, the wild card uh, character which was Saraya this year so yeah email or um, put it on the Facebook group and give me some ideas or give us some ideas I should say and uh, we can see we can see what we can do and um, then we'll go ahead that sounds like a yes to me everybody possibly <laughs> that's as good as you're going to get black eye just, just before uh, you do yeah. that thing you were going to do what's, what's the black eye so um i a long long time ago <laughs> i used to uh, do a lot of judo um, oh it wasn't uh, Gemma uh, though. Oh, I, I thought Gemma would thump you no uh, not this time no i did a lot of judo and yeah, did, uh, I, subsequently i've taken rosa to judo yeah. and uh, i was talking did, did rosa do that to you all no. oh, right okay i was talking to somebody at judo actually said you know what i remember when i was a kid at judo and mm. all of the other kids or some of the other kids their dads used to get on the mat and they used to go i used to do judo when i was a kid <laughs> and i used to think oh my god that's like yeah, all right granddad you know get your get your judo suit on um and now i'm that granddad <laughs> So I, I'm back in judo with Rosa, um, and I used to do it to you know a fairly kind of decent level, I suppose. Yeah. So um, I had my first. Uh, uh, um, you did a lot of sporting things to a decent level. I mean, you were in um, um, uh, lo- uh, lo- not London Irish, London Welsh, London Welsh. Sorry, London Irish, London. <laughs> <laughs> a stupid thing to say, Lon- London Welsh, and and you were champion um, judo. Well, I wouldn't say champion, but. I was, I did it. Yeah, yeah I was in the Welsh work. team. Yeah. I was in the Welsh well, there team. There we go. I represented we my country. Up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, but it was a lot of fun. And, uh, I, you know, I really wish I'd carried on with you. How comes you ended up with a black eye then? Did, 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 was the person slightly better than you then? Yeah, basically. Oh, okay. um, I, yes, uh, I would say substantially better oh, than me. Oh although I was at least a thousand stones heavier you? than her. It was a her. All oh, right. It's very good. Although she was a British team player. Anyway, so there's my black eye. And, and after this, well, I have to make a little video for Fujifilm with a black eye. <laughs> and tomorrow I have to go to a wedding with a black eye. And Well, you know what? And I said this yesterday to you on email, so it won't surprise you when I say it again. Nobody, but nobody tomorrow at your wedding is going to, looking at you, and going to think, don't, don't mess with this guy. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask you, can we do some formal pictures? Can we do some canned shots? <laughs> canned? What's canned? That? Is that the same canned? canned laughter? Is that laughter? <laughs> right. Um, there was something that we uh, we, we mentioned uh, last week or the week before, and, and uh, we've we've kind of had a, a lukewarm response so far to it. Um, and uh, but we know we know you're waiting out there to do this and take part. What was it, Kev? Photography disasters. Yeah. There should be a. There definitely should be a. Yeah, we can do better than that. Hang on. Photography disasters. No, that's. No. <laughs> <laughs> We need a new jingle, photography disasters. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so photography disasters. Uh, we had a couple in actually, but we need we need a few more. And um, it, you will absolutely you need to tell us if you want to remain remain anonymous. Yeah. Um, and only me and Neil will. Uh, sorry, Neil and I should say uh, will laugh at you <laughs> on the inside. Black belt grammar. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, send them in. Come on, your photography disasters. We've all done them. We've yeah. all had them, and uh, we will read them out, and uh, maybe we'll. We'll, uh, we'll 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 figure out some prizes or something for some of the most spectacular ones. Don't make it up though. Don't lie. No, no, yeah. But you can embellish because people do embellish slightly, don't they? Do they? I th- yeah, always. Hmm. Okay. Um, morning, Kevin Neil. Uh, this is a, a. How do you know it was morning when we were recording this? It could be the evening. Uh, this is a question for Kevin in his role as an ex-photographer. Are you ready for an awkward question? Uh-oh. Do you know in advance 
uh, any new things that Fuji are looking to do with regard to firmware upgrades, and can you put in requests? Oh, this could be a sort of back way of uh, <laughs> of making sure that that you get your questions, and if you send them via Kevin, your requests. One thing I'd particularly like is the ability to set the cus- custom function buttons so they can be programmed differently depending upon whether you're shooting video or stills. This one comes from Barry Paffy. I'm shooting a lot of video on the Fujis as well as stills and I find it a tad frustrating and limiting that I can't set the function buttons to suit the different formats. It would be great if they could separate the functions a bit like the cameras. Uh, remember the settings last used on video or stills. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I see that. Uh, does he say which camera he's using? No, he doesn't, because X-T3, you're okay on that. Yeah, you? I think X-T3, yeah. Barry, if you're not using X-T3, oh, you then, need, then yeah. you, you, you should look at that for the video stuff. Yes. Um, but to go back to the uh, the original um, point of the question, firmware-wise, actually, as ex-photographers, we don't generally get uh, get uh, much advance notice of that. And, um, you know, we occasionally, they might um, they might send us a... a a beta or a prototype or whatever of a firmware to yeah. to test, but of course that involves installing it on our own cameras, which yeah. is uh, which it could be problematic. Yeah, and really, you'd you'd, you'd want sort of a test camera if you're going to do that. Yeah, sort of stuff, I mean, I mean, it it does happen, um, but generally they do they they keep their own internal testing going on. Um, and uh, I remember when the the the, the XT two the firmware four catastrophe happened. Um, and they pulled it within a couple of hours. You know, it was bad, and yeah. uh, and because it was me that kind of stamped my feet loud enough, I was the lucky one to be sent the, <laughs> the prototype uh-huh. firmware. And uh-huh. I spent the next forty eight hours taking ten thousand pictures on my camera. Um, and bless them, they got the new firmware out within like three days. So, um, in terms of getting the uh, the information to Fujifilm, honestly, as ex photographers, and I think I speak for all of us, um, we we listen we watch we we pick up uh, ideas and things like that from from the community and of course we you know we'll pass that back when they ask us for it but there is you can do that yourself you can use twitter and you can reply to instagram posts all that kind of stuff i know for a fact that the you know these things do get picked up and you know you may think oh there's no point in me just asking for that because why are they mm-hmm. going to listen to me but actually they do collate this information i don't think there's any kind of official um, like website or anything where you can you can kind of say firmware requests and or you know or anything like that. It'd be a good idea that wouldn't it, it would be. I love the Adobe one where they have the um you know they have like feature requests on Adobe mm, website mm. and you can it tells you which ones have been upvoted the most and which ones haven't and which ones they're they're you know they're they're testing and everything, um, which is pretty cool. So. Um, yeah, so you can you can do it yourself. You can you can get in touch with T- Terrell Woods. Actually, he's got a question coming up in the, in the next couple of weeks. But uh, funnily enough, this is residing very close to Barry Paffy's email here. Um, he, he had a gripe, and he said, "I have all that. Uh, I have all a lot of kit, and yet Fuji want me to own a GFX to be in the Pro Service Program. Big fail," he says. Now he's he is in Malibu. Um, yeah, that's America. The so it's American, American isn't it? It's a different way of working there, isn't there? The American um, Pro uh, uh, FPS Fujifilm Professional Services was I'm going to say was in inverted commas only open to GFX users. Right. Now my understanding is that that's changing. Oh, okay. Uh, however, do not again quote me on that. And it's you know each of the what you have to remember with Fujifilm is that North America, UK, Europe, uh, they're all very separate entities. And uh, they all obviously sit under the umbrella of, of Japan, but they're all separate entities. In fact, some of them in the very small countries are um, uh, what they call it um, franchises. Right. You know, you have oh, okay. uh, one particular shop in Malta, for example, is the authorized importer of Fujifilm. I'm using Malta as an example. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is the authorized importer of Fujifilm cameras and, and thus becomes the service center and the, the oh, face of Fujifilm. There. I didn't know that. Um, but they're not actually employed or kind of um, you know part of Fujifilm. So yeah. Yeah, it's very different all over the world and uh, we are very very lucky in the UK and Europe generally because the Fuji Film Professional Services is amazing um, the service centre here in Bedford or in Bedford is uh, the guys there are, are very good and most of the you know a lot of the times when people um, turn, return their cameras for fixing in Europe they actually end up in Bedford they oh fix did they? In Bedford. Yep. ah ok didn't know that yep. well Terrell we'll save the, the other uh, part of your question which was a longer question um, for uh, another week coming up very shortly. Uh, go on, your question. Okay, so uh, I have a question here from uh, Scott Carney, and it says, Hi, Kevin and Neil. What camera settings do you use for your YouTube videos? Do you film on your X-T3 autofocus IAF? Do you use an external monitor like an Atomos at all? Thanks in advance, Scott. Yeah. You've, uh, don't you use a, an Atomos? Uh, I have one. 
you don't use it. Is it still in the cupboard? <laughs> still in the I, box, isn't I, it? I bought a Ninja yeah. Fire, but not for that purpose, mm. for a different purpose. Um, not for monitoring the video. So um, uh, the last thing I want, I'm doing a YouTube video and I've got the camera facing me. The last thing I want to do is see my own face, <laughs> you know, because then I, I, I realise what, what it, people are seeing. It'll help you frame though, won't it? Uh, not really. Don't you have a monitor to help you frame when you're recording YouTube stuff? No, do because 23 mil is wide enough and I just sit. If I can see my reflection in the in the lens, then I yeah. know that I'm framed. And then actually, if you shoot it, do you shoot 4K for when you're doing your... Your films. Yes. So that you can crop in if you need to. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah. But yes, you could. Um, anyway, you should answer this question more because you, you, you're well, far more I mean, filmmaker you, than you, me. You, well, you make more YouTube videos than I do. I'm, I, I noticed uh, you're, you're planning on one a week now that we're in winter. <sighs> yes, one a week. Hold him to that one, everybody. Um, all right, so my answer is yes. I use my X-T3 for filming mm. my YouTube videos. Same here. Uh, and I, I use the use... XH1 actually now as well. Okay, so XH1, XT3. I do use auto fo- uh, continuous focus. Do you with face detection, but not eye detection? Yeah. Now I don't use eye detection because I've found that if you use eye detection when you're filming in the in the, in the studio uh, environment, it does tend to wander off sometimes. Well, I, I did an entire. I, I recorded an entire film once, and it took me hours and hours of recuts. And you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't can't imagine the expletives I have when when I have to repeat. <laughs> words and everything and so i did the entire thing and and this is where a monitor would you know have what come you in. need you need anatomist this would have come <laughs> into use <laughs> you'd have seen uh, yourself in focus i sat down on the computer all yeah. ready to start doing the the fun bit of editing yeah, yeah. and then i realized that the face detection had oh, focused no. on a picture of albie which was in the <gasps> background on his eye on his face, on yeah, his face. and it just stayed there, and for the whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just so angry. So well, I, isn't that I int- moved the picture of Albie from yeah. behind me in in my YouTube yeah. videos for a start. Interesting. I'm, I'm just looking behind me to see if there's no, there's nothing really here. No, no, there's nothing that would. Yeah. So yes, I do use uh, continuous focus. I use uh, face detection. I yeah. shoot at 1.4 on my 23 mil lens. Oh, so you do shoot really quite shallow. Yeah, because I like to get that cinematic oh, feel to the film. See, I don't. I I usually shoot. Uh, F4. Mm. In fact, I think the settings I have, what have I got here? Light. In fact, I've got a little a clipboard here so that all I need to do is put the settings in and it's always the same. Uh, what do we have? Um, 1855. Yeah, F4. F4. Yeah, I mean, I just quite like the the little depth yeah. of field to it, oh, but I get that. Uh, yeah, 23 mil lens and uh, I use the. Um, I've got an NTG. I've actually got two. I was, I've got an NTG2 and an NTG4+. Plus. Yeah. I'm not actually sure much of the difference. Between. I think one is phantom-powered only and one can use a recharge battery. Yeah. That's it, mm, pretty much. NTG3 for me, because the, the depth, the warmth of that NTG3. In yeah. fact, next week's um, episode features an interview with... Uh, well, it's the second part. We have actually had Jason Florio on before talking mm-hmm. about the 9-11 um uh, well that day that he shot uh, those those um, infamous pictures on 911 um but he's talking about the 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 Mediterranean um struggle and um, being a photojournalist covering that particular story but that that interview was recorded using um uh, i think it was a zoom a zoom h6 i think and um and the NTG3, and it's a beautiful. It's the warmth of that microphone is is superb. And you can get very expensive Sennheiser microphones that are often used in uh, in, in in video and television studios, etc. And and yeah, I think you can tell the difference. But you get blindingly close with an N- NTG3. You yeah, really, really do. Yeah, really, really uh, and, do. and as much as Neil keeps telling me this, it's it's much more about the environment you're recording in. So my my studio is like a big open cavern. <laughs> where everything clatters around. Hello, hello. Yeah, hello, yeah exactly. Hello, hello. Um, right, okay. Um, okay, you'll go. Uh, cool question. Another, another time for a question. We have, haven't we? Yeah. Um, Steve Ford. Hi, guys. Love the show. Hopefully you don't run out of great content anytime soon. Doesn't sound like a threat. Uh, what do you think of the pros and cons of full frame versus a- APS-C? Now, we haven't had a question like this for a long, 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 long time. And I know it's one of those things that in the past... Uh, certainly, those that work for Fujifilm, I know I've seen I've, I've seen them at exhibitions where they raise their eyes at that point, think, "Oh God, here we go again." So I thought, well, why not? So Steve Ford's answered that. I mean, full frame has what is it, two and a half times the surface area of, of, of an APS-C? That's right, isn't it? Uh, so ge- generally, would you say you're, no? It's not it, two it, and a half times. Isn't it two and a half times? No, it's like a third. Have I got that right. Gump, you, could you fact check us? It's a third or something. For I mean, I'd, full frame advantage is certainly. 
generally you'd expect a broader dynamic range, wouldn't you? And and higher low light performance. That's what that's what it's that's what the full frame aficionados will say. That's why I shoot full frame. Surely. Mm, yeah. I honestly I don't really know the technicalities of it. I, I'm not so sure about the dynamic range, but certainly depth of field. Of course, um, and technically, if you're looking at it from a scientific point of view, it should be better in low light because of the um, the pixel uh, the, the, the pixel density yes. rather than the pixel count. Um, but saying that, the uh, in the, originally when the uh, Fujifilm X Pro One and X One Hundred original mm-hmm. ones came out, they were they were pretty dire in low light. But oh. all of that's been amazingly yeah. fixed now. And and the thing is, the for example, the XT Three and in fact the X Pro Three use a backlit sensor. So that enables using uh, some kind of very funky wizardry with photons and protons and stuff <laughs> to <laughs> make it make the noise in low light even better or quicker <laughs> to focus and stuff. So yeah, I mean, to me, it's uh, it, to me absolutely the only conversation really, the only decision should be made um, full frame to uh, APS-C is ultimately whether you want that extra depth of field and it, it, which is quite marginal. So it comes down to that only. In my Are you mind, sure about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. I, I, I honestly don't think there's any other reason so to so, have no. a. And, th- and that's a very valid reason, by the way. Yeah. Some people do want that, and that absolutely is a very valid reason. Uh, it's, you know, there's no right or wrong, but I don't think any of the other stuff is, is particularly relevant. So really, it all, it all comes down to that that word, doesn't it? Bouquet? <coughs> Bouquet? <laughs> I think when even, we talk even about... the chickens know it. <laughs> the chicken knows the bouquet word. <laughs> get, get the chicken to say blurry now. I know, it only says okay. <laughs> so I think that'll be that's going to be <laughs> that tickles me. Sorry, the chicken that can say okay. Um, yeah, so that's the only reason. Okay. Well, in my mind, honestly, that's the. If somebody was to ask me, that would be my my answer. Would be like, yeah. if you want more depth of field, slightly, then full frame is is for you. If not, then don't. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That's it. The rest of it is, in my mind, irrelevant. Right, your question. Okay, so this one is from Colin Miller, and he says, Hi, Kevin and Neil. Firstly, I want to say thank you for the advice that you share, both from Fujicast and everywhere else, etc., 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 blah, 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 blah. I'm a big believer in pushing my photographic abilities as much as possible through the exploration of different genres, and was wondering if this is an idea that both that you both subscribe to. And if so, could you elaborate on the different areas of photography that you have tried your hand at in an effort to learn more about the art form? Yeah. Was the process beneficial to your business? And if not, did you still feel it was a worthwhile uh, on a personal basis? Keep up the good work, Colin Miller. Thank you, Colin. I've tried lots of different genres. You've done some sport, I know. I, I did um, some school photography right at the start. That Now, that was actually uh, pro- probably one of our... Our um our best periods in in terms of income was school photography, mm. but it drove me batty. I think I, I think Colin's getting at here is is not much so much about what we've done in our business, but more about you know how have we kind of deviated from basically wedding photography to other other things. What now? Uh, yeah, as oh, okay. a as a either a, a release in terms of personal artistic merit or okay. in terms of you know helping our business and i suppose like street photography to a For certain you, extent yeah, street that, photography. um i don't know if i really have anything that i've i mean you i would say for you film work if maybe? i if i was answering the question on your behalf i would say yeah the film stuff so you're you're kind of um but i don't get a chance to do much of it but i suppose so i suppose that would be my release when i when i do yeah so the ones that you have done especially yeah. the uh the the mini documentaries if you like yeah um you know they're really powerful and, and beautiful so i guess that's probably your kind of yeah. push out from it yeah um yeah, I, isn't it a dream for everybody to to be able to have personal projects? Okay, so and look, get on with it. Hang on a minute. Look, I'm going to write your check. There we go. That's uh, that's a million pounds. Not enough. <laughs> Hold on. Two and a half million. Okay. Okay. So, what are you? Are you you're, are you going to continue with weddings? What are you going to What are you going to do over the next couple of years? Oh, I didn't know you were going to throw that at me. Well, I mean, that's... two and a half million pounds. Would I go? Well, to was my... one enough then? Well, put it this way: if you gave me my two, I've and... just given you more than I should have given you. No, a million pounds. A million. A millionaire these days is not the same as a millionaire used to be. Well, like no. when we were growing up, you a millionaire <laughs> during the war. During the war, a millionaire would be somebody who had a million pounds in the bank, yeah. and they would be, uh, you know, that would be made for life. Yeah. But no, it's not. They reckon now what we used to assume, like in the 70s and 80s, what we the, financially, the equivalent of a millionaire then is now 4.8 million. 
So it also depends how old you are. I mean, c- could I make a million last <laughs> to the end of my wretched life? <laughs> oh my god, this is this is going downhill it's very okay, rapidly. Shakespearean now, darling. Um, I, I, so it, put it this way, right? If you just gave me a check for two point eight million pounds, no, hang on, two point five. Oh, I thought you said two point nine. No, no. <laughs> let's just round it up to three, right? So you've given me a check for three million pounds. All right. Uh, would I go to my wedding tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, of course I would. Yeah, Absolutely, I would. Be- yeah, be- uh, only because you. I'd be a bit more cheery. <laughs> yeah. Would you invest in more smiles per month? Uh, you can't buy smiles. <laughs> <laughs> you inherit. You just inherit those. No, I mean it's a really good. That's a really good question. You know, would you? I don't know. It's a really tough question. Well, regardless of the money, I would. If, certainly... So if you could sit there and do what you wanted to do in photography or filmmaking, or or maybe it wouldn't even be photography. What would you be doing? No, but I think it is. I think it partly is about the money, and and that that question is, you know. It, it, I think we should answer this question. Yeah. So, uh, because I want you to answer it as well. Well, I've written that one in. Do I get a strap? uh, No, you're about a couple of weeks late for that. I've stumbled over this already. So, um, right. So, when you give me that that check for 4.1 million pounds, I'm going to share it. I I would absolutely, definitely honour all of my bookings. Absolutely. Would I take on new bookings? If I'm absolutely blunt about it, probably not. Oh, probably not. Okay, for four point one million pounds, or what was it? You four point three? <laughs> it just you said, keeps wasn't it? Going up. <laughs> so um, for one million, if I had one million, then I would. But I would use it. I would build my business, and right. I would branch out into a business other in, stuff in photography, yes. wedding photography, yeah. or a bit, or uh, a, both. A YouTube or weddings. I uh, maybe I'd think about um, yeah, video stuff, YouTube, right. uh, commercial, you know, or. Uh, certainly spend more time on personal stuff for right. sure but with a you know with an emphasis on on actually making a, a very very strong business um you know we're in this country we are we're pegged by uh, i see it as entrepreneurial tax like vat barriers and stuff like that and i know some people are beyond those barriers but you know it's hard for us if you can just throw a whole bucket load of money into your business and break through that vat barrier yeah. without any consequence then you could you know i firmly believe i could fly but um if somebody you know when you write me that check for 5.1 <laughs> million pound later then i probably wouldn't i would probably just uh, buy a car and a new house and just give up i'd take a camera with me while i gave up but i would i wouldn't be business i would be shooting but not business wise right okay no why why would you do it yeah why would you do it would you tell me what would you do um <clears throat> i'm about i'm going to give you a check for ten thousand pounds <laughs> yes yours would, is considerably you, less than what i gave you would you uh would you <laughs> would you shoot your wedding your next wedding well i'm the same as you I'm, i mean I, i'm honorable in that respect and i would honor all those bookings of course i would and there are some people some very special stories and people that i booked on for next year that um that i wouldn't want to miss for the world um but um yeah i i, I think i would be looking uh, taking my business in um, in new directions. I'd, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just choose the the very few? Because I still run a wedding business, so I still have to um, shoot more weddings than I would perhaps choose to. So maybe I would slim that down mm-hmm. slightly, be very, very specific about what mm-hmm. I want to shoot, yep. and then branch out into... I've always wanted to make more documentaries. I'd love to have the money to you know take a month off and go to, a, to Australia or wherever and... And go record some documentaries with photographers that I, I really admire. Yeah. Well, so I'll, well, I'll give you a check for six thousand pounds. Started at ten. It's, it's gone down to six. Not six? I said four. So yeah, I, I definitely got the. Uh, I've, I've definitely got the short straw in in this relationship. You know, Kev. There's no doubt about that. Um, thank you to this week's panel of guests from the X Weddings Conference. Next week, Jason Florio returns to talk about his mission to make pictures of the migrant crisis at sea. If you have liked this week's show, please take a moment, share it, and we will consider you legendary material. Apple Podcast Reviews, they're fab, and we do read every single one of them. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, do please, because we're waiting in there to say hello to you. And thank you to your questions, because as 65 people last week said... There we go. (laughs) They did one for you as well, by the way. You know which one that's going to be, surely. Yep. Don't forget the social... 
yeah. absolutely. I right. can definitely hear Peter Kasbergen in there. You can't pick I can. Ass now. I can. Really? I can always. I, I've got. I've got special ears that pick out Dutch people <laughs> from a million miles. <laughs> okay. Is he from Holland? Uh, he is oh. from Holland. Yeah. So uh, yeah, do send them in because your your questions are really really important. If we don't get your questions, everything on this show stops quicker than five old blokes in a Merthyr Tidfil pub <laughs> watching some Egypt walk in with a three lines football shirt on. Oh, if you d- if you don't get those in, yes, we, we we don't have anything to read out. And your photography disasters too. Oh yes, remember those. Definitely, we really want your photography disasters. And we promise they will be anonymous if you tell us if to be anonymous. If not, other yeah, do we'll, in big we'll in. big letters, anonymous, yes. please. Yeah, yeah. Um, send them in via the website address, which is click at fujicast.co.uk. Music is from Blue Wednesday, and this week's payoffs. Uh, Kev, you, you can have your famous one. Kevin's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye, and his website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. I'm Alex Lester. You can tweet me at Alex the Dark Lord or Facebook me. That's even warmer, Alex Lester. At the best time of the day show. Even Thank warmer. you. And uh, I'm going to use our, our good Scottish friend Murray. Neil's Instagram is Neil James. His website is neiljames.com for pictures and one to one mentoring. Remember, you can hear his other photography podcast, which is called Breathe Pictures, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Murray McMillan. My Instagram is Murray underscore McMillan. And my website is murraymcmillanphotography.com. Thanks very much. Okay, so send your thoughts, your questions, your feedback, and your worn, worn MS socks in, please. Well, we'll see you next week on the show. Bye bye. Bye bye. The food. Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.